tonight on Greater Boston with COVID fatigue at an all-time high and cases once again rising anyway. Is your COVID prep kit up to date? And what should you be doing to keep yourself safe these days anyway? Two doctors join me on that. Then later, a closer look at the Boston Athletic Association's decision to ban most runners who live in Russia and Belarus and those who want to run under those nation's flags. As the weather gets warmer and more people get out and about, there's a pretty strong feeling out there that most want to move on from thinking about COVID. There's fewer face masks, fewer mandates, but here's a sampling of just a few of the headlines from today. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, test positive for COVID, quote, was at the White House with Biden, end quote. Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont, positive for COVID. Massachusetts coronavirus cases jump by 27%. Hospitalizations rise. CDC identifies COVID-19 reinfections as soon as 23 days apart. And oh yeah, there's a new variant likely coming our way, and you guessed it, it's even more contagious than those before. So where do we stand now, and what should we be doing to protect ourselves, both when rates are lower and in preparation for when they get higher? Joining me are Dr. Cassandra Pierre, Medical Director of Public Health Programs at Boston Medical Center, and Dr. Lakshman Swamy, a critical care physician at Cambridge Health Alliance and instructor at Harvard Medical School. Doctors, welcome back. Good to see you both. I want to jump right in here, Dr. Pierre. Um, we're going to keep getting variants here, um, and we can't predict, and I know I say we like I'm with you, but you can't predict how serious they're going to be until they've already hit us. Um, what should our thinking be at this moment right now? I, I actually appreciate you using the collective we because there is still this sense of unpredictability. You know, we've looked at other countries to kind of determine where we might be in the next few weeks. We see with this new variant BA.2 or subvariant that it may not be as easy to determine as we think we, we have been able to do in the past. So at this time where numbers are slowly creeping up, but still relatively no one we want to get, engage, um, you know, I, I think what's important to keep in mind is that we do need to keep looking at those numbers, looking at where we are in terms of COVID positivity. As much as we wish to put this behind us, it is still very much with us. We need to understand that increasingly we see more severe COVID among people who are unvaccinated or undervaccinated. So those vaccines really are still incredibly important. Um, and we need to also think about the times where we're going to be more at risk when we're at large gatherings, especially indoor spaces and thinking about seasonal increases um, towards the fall and winter. Um, I think it's really important though to keep our wits about us, look to see what the data is showing and understand that we, um, you know, we should be also improving our underlying health, uh, making sure that we're addressing any issues like diabetes, high blood pressure that put us at higher risk for more severe complications and speaking to our doctors about vaccines and what's right for us. Dr. Swabby, my parents, um, my dad was born in 1918, my mom in 1920, they lived through the depression. My dad was in World War II. Um, they, we lived in a hurricane you know, place. And at one point, both of them uh, separately had lost uh, belongings to hurricanes hitting. Uh, they were both, um, I, I wouldn't say overly cautious, but they always had an exit plan, always had a strategy. Uh, my mom lost friends in the Coconut Grove fire uh, in Boston. So whenever we went into a restaurant, she always pointed out the, where the exits were to make sure you could get out. Can we, can we, and I say we again, can we start moving people to understand that there should be a basic level of being ready, being prepared to deal with COVID if we want to get to a place where there are fewer infections and fewer transmissions? Yeah, you know, I, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. I wish, I wish everyone was as focused on being prepared for, for what could happen as, as you're describing your parents. Um, they're, they're, you know, the important thing is being prepared. Why? Because we're not quite there yet, right? We are enjoying still to a degree. Um, I'm in the ICU. I don't have any COVID patients here. It's amazing. This is, uh, that is still, I still feel like I'm in a bit of a reprieve, a lull. But you're right, numbers are going up, new variants. This is the COVID always feels like it's just on the horizon coming over the horizon. I hope it doesn't, but it, it may well, and, and it really feels like it will at some point. What can we do to be prepared? The key thing here is the masks. 
Masks and testing kits at home go a really long way for everyone to be able to protect themselves. And when to use them, we need to get a lot better at knowing when do I need to test before I gather? And in what occasions do I want to be masking? I would say right now, indoors in a public place is a good time to be masking again. All right, let's talk a, a little bit about um, what the tools are that we can put in our, our COVID preparedness uh, toolkit. Before we get there, Dr. Pierre, what should, you talked about indicators we should look at. I'm a big fan of watching the wastewater numbers uh, here in the greater Boston area, because um, that I think is a, a great indication of how many infections there are, rather than how many people got tested or didn't get tested. So is that like a key place that we should be looking and where else should we look for good information to let us know what our action should be? Absolutely. Um, that trajectory, the rate of increase that we see with that wastewater, it's important. And we have seen that slowly rising, not as quickly as we saw with Omicron or original Omicron B8.1 and the Delta variant. But certainly we are seeing that steadily rise. And as you say, um, there is no version of take-home kit for the wastewater. We all use the same septic system. So, um, you know, it that is is certainly something that is increasingly becoming really a pillar of our public health efforts, our epidemiology efforts in, in order to understand patterns of disease and, you know, where we can expect to see increases. You know, we also look at the community level. I think that's still important when we're looking at COVID positivity. Um, for example, here in Boston, um, you know, our numbers had been low, less than 3%. Um, but now, as of today, they've crept up again to, or yesterday rather, to 5.3%, COVID positivity 5.3%. And the importance there is that there are thresholds around that. This particular threshold, COVID positivity, um, reaching 5% was something that we had used previously in February to determine whether or not it was safe to take off those masks in indoor spaces. And now that it's above those, those levels, um, you know, consistent with what Dr. Swami was saying, it does suggest that we should be you know, changing our behavior accordingly. Um, and the other things, of course, that we use that thankfully that are low at this point is looking at the percentage of ICU beds that are occupied and the number of hospitalizations that we have. And thankfully, even though our cases are rising, those numbers are low. So important to know and keep those in mind. Dr. Swami, you mentioned um, testing and home kits. And um, I, I was a big advocate of getting tests early. I, I feel it was a failure of both the Trump and Biden administration that we didn't get tests sooner than we did. We can still, I just got my second order from the United States Postal Service. I put the order in, I think just last week, and I got them yesterday, four free tests for my household, my second order. Our, our, and I also know that you know, insurance companies are mandated to refund what you purchase, I think up to 12 bucks a, a kit. I know it's a pain in the neck to do it with all the paperwork, but at the same time, there are free tests available still. Are you urging folks to, to take advantage of that now while we're in a quote unquote lull? Yeah, exactly. You know, I'll, I'll tell you what, a couple of weeks ago, I was having small indoor gatherings with my friends and I wasn't so worried about testing. And now um, we're starting it back up again. We're saying, hey, we're going to get together uh, to, to hang out this weekend. Let's, uh, you know, you know, people from five different families or something, not a big gathering. Um, I think it's important to still be able to live and do these things. It gives you a large measure of protection to say, Let's get the tests and let's use them for this purpose to make sure that we're not um, we're not spreading it to each other unknowingly, which unfortunately I've seen happen in my community as well. Like it is really spreading. It's also a great time to still get masks. We don't have to, to, to focus too much on that as we've talked about it a lot. I, I, I want to talk to um, Dr. Pierre about the vaccinations and the boosters um, because um, I people I know are trying not to be trying not to practice medicine without any licenses. Right. But we are um, sort of trying to sort through what we are. Like I got the Johnson and Johnson and then I got the Moderna booster uh, in the fall. I'm 60 years old. I have asthma. I, don't, I know I'm going to talk to my doctor about this, but I'm not. Do I want to get it now? Should I wait to see if the wastewater numbers go up? Um, is there a, a is just talking to your doctor about whether or not you should get the booster if you qualify the, the best route? I certainly think it's it's certainly something we always refer back to when we have these conversations. It's important to make sure that you are speaking to someone who knows your medical history intimately, knows what your risk is, um, and also someone who you speak to about what other risk behaviors you might be engaging in, because that's also important. Um, maybe not as important as your underlying risk conditions, but also important to think about um, when you're thinking about boosters. But um, you know, I, I think it is a difficult time. 
with the uncertainty of where what we're seeing with the numbers, in addition to what we're seeing with successive waves of information on um, boosting and its efficacy, um, you know, I, I think many people are now, I think, a little bit starting to split um, from what we've been hearing in terms of, you know, what the FDA may say it's okay to do. Um, we want to take a critical lens to this and think about what are we trying to do with these vaccines and these boosters, really wanting to reduce the risk of severe consequences, including hospitalization and death. Um, and so I think it's important to think about what our end goal is when we're thinking about these things and what time of year and what makes sense to do. Um, I think it does make sense to reach out to your doctor, someone who has a lot of intimate information about you and where your risk lies. All right. So Dr. Swami, here's my, um, my gosh, people make me crazy uh, sec part of the segment here. Um, I was uh, reminded recently of uh, a conversation that Donald Trump, then President Donald Trump had with Bob Woodward around the book that came out. And in it, um, in the conversation, Trump was expressing how much more severe COVID was than he was telling people. But the part I wanna talk about is he was ex expressing surprise to Woodward about the flu numbers, that this was news to Donald Trump. And frankly, it's news to a lot of people. And I'm not, I'm not taking a jab at, at Trump on this this point, that, you know, anywhere between 20 and 65,000 people die in the United States every year from the flu or flu-related complications based on how serious the flu is or which, which variant we have of the flu. We've had a, an effective flu vaccine for I don't know how many decades we've had it. We have an antiviral treatment. Um, many people still don't think they have the flu because they're asymptomatic and they may be contagious. And our vaccination rates for the flu um, aren't really that high as you would expect with all this great science we have. If we can't really get our brain around how to protect ourselves from the flu with all this history, what, how do we get people to protect themselves against COVID, which we're still getting our feet under and trying to figure out how to live with? It, it's a great question, and it's a it's a great example. I mean, we as medical professionals, we we've, we've seen the devastating effects of influenza for you know every, every winter. I see it all the time. Um, it's catastrophic, and it's it's not as simple as saying, oh, that person was high risk. Not at all. But the thing that's different with coronavirus, um, with COVID, is that a lot more people have been touched directly or indirectly by this in a very serious way. It's because it is just so much more deadly. Um, and there are there are differences here. That that are really important to say. So first of all, absolutely, everyone should get a flu shot every year. It really saves lives. And um, I mean, I'm never gonna miss that. But with coronavirus, it's important to know that there, you know, for example, Paxlovid, there's there's prescription treatments that you can get when you are when you have coronavirus. If you are in any way higher risk, you should talk to your doctor the second you test positive because that can make a dramatic difference. It's available across the state now in Walgreens, CVS. You can find it, and that that goes a really long way. And that's profoundly different. You know, the treatments that we have for coronavirus are different. They do do more. We're learning more and more. And I think we're going to have a lot more in our arsenal than just vaccination. Not to downplay that, please. Not to downplay vaccination at all. But this is probably the way forward is going to be a synergy of all of these things. So I would really encourage us to, to take all of these diseases seriously. The masks work for all of these respiratory diseases. They're really beneficial. Um, and I, I hope that we as a society can kind of like learn from all of this collectively and move forward. But certainly it's concerning at how much pseudoscience, disinformation, uh, misinformation is out there about all this. Dr. Peer, I'll give you the opportunity to give the pitch that if you've been putting off that doctor's appointment or that, uh, that uh, test that you need done, time to do it now, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that is most one of the more important things in prepping really is just to make sure that you are taking care of your underlying health, making sure that you get your screening, um, that you have a chance to improve your health. Um, that's going to put you in good stead for so many things, including COVID. Um, and this is the right time to do it. The weather is great. You want to make sure that you have a good summer, um, keep yourself healthy and learn all the tips about what should be happening in your life to, to make sure that we can continue to enjoy our families. All right, Dr. Lakshmi Dr. Cassandra Pierre, thank you so much for joining me. We appreciate your expertise. Take care. Thank you. With punishments piling up for Russia over the atrocities they're committing in Ukraine, including today their suspension from the UN Human Rights Council, the Boston Athletic Association is adding to the list as well, banning any athletes from Russia and Belarus who currently live there 
from running this year's marathon. And anyone from those countries who doesn't live there, they can run, but not under those nation's flags. BAA President CEO Tom Grilk said in a statement, running is a global sport, and as such, we must do what we can to show our support to the people of Ukraine. Joining me now is sports journalist Shira Springer, journalist and lecturer at MIT Sloan in Boston University, and Dan Fitzgerald, head coach and co-founder of Heartbreak Hill Running Society. Thanks for joining me. Shira, I, I want to start with you first and, and just ask what your take is on the BAA's decision. Well, I think what they're doing is, as Grilk said, showing support for Ukraine. It is primarily, I would say, a symbolic gesture. Because if you look at the numbers last year, I think it was around 35 Russians who competed in the Boston Marathon. So we're not talking about large numbers. We're also not talking about any professional or elite athletes. There are no Russian athletes from uh, who are, will be competing in either the marathon, the 5K, or the Invitational Mile. So largely a symbolic gesture, but I think an important symbolic gesture, particularly given Putin's um, desire to use sports as a way of showcasing and showing national might. And you know he really enjoys putting his athletes, those Russian athletes out there to show the power and might of his country. So an important symbolic gesture, but a symbolic gesture mostly nonetheless. And David, Gerald, your take? Yeah, I, I agree. It is mostly symbolic, you know. But I, I think about it from uh, an athlete's perspective. I always, it's, it's unfortunate when an athlete trains and doesn't get to compete, uh, you know, when the circumstances are outside of their control. You know, on the other hand, the scale of the atrocities uh, is is astounding, uh, unimaginable, and anything that can um, make any difference in, in people's awareness of what's happening, you know, through any community, I think is important. Um, I think sport, in particular, these days. Uh, is feeling more responsibility to step up and, and speak out in these things. And, you know, I'm I'm proud of the BAA doing that. You know, the, the, the race running the Boston Marathon is a privilege. Uh, and and it it's it's a symbol of unity. It's a symbol of healing. It's it's been subject of a terrorist attack uh, for it to stand on the side of human rights, I think, is important. So the challenge of of these sorts of actions, um, especially when we're right off of the Winter Olympics, where there was uh, much protest and concern about the human rights violations in China and the you know, embrace of the world of China during uh, the Olympics and whether or not it should have been held there or not, um, we, we come to this now. And there are uh, five countries that top the worst countries for human rights and rule of law in 2021, uh, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, China, and Iran. Um, they're not, none of those athletes would, are banned from participating in the BAA. Should they be? Um, is this a, a, a route, a path that we want to start taking when it comes to events like this, Shira? Well, I think I'm going to refer back to what Dan said about, you know, you feel for the athletes. I myself am also a marathoner, so I understand what it's like to put in those miles and train for an event like this, something you have on your calendar basically a year in advance um, when you are thinking about uh, running a big major marathon like Boston. And so I think you don't want to go down that slippery slope with those other countries. We are in a very, very unique moment with Ukraine and the war, you know, between Russia and Ukraine, and also the aggression of Putin and his love of sports and his use of sports um, as a symbol for his country and what it can accomplish. So I think this, that you, you know, we should not do a blanket ban of athletes. We should take this on a case by case basis. This is the moment to show support for Ukraine. Yes, there are other issues, human rights issues with all of the countries you mentioned. This perpetually comes up in sports, by the way. We are, and we're gonna face it again with the World Cup later this year in Qatar. So, you know, those are issues we have to deal, I think, with on a case by case basis, rather than say, oh, well, if we're doing Russia, then we need to do Iran and we need to do this country and we need to do that country. But, now, I, but I would push back here and say, you know, I, I mean, no one is disagreeing that what's happening in Ukraine is, is beyond, beyond awful. 
But, mm -hmm. you know, someone might say what's been happening in China for decades is, is also awful. Or someone might say what's the, the war in Syria and, and, and the, the trauma that they've been going through, Yemen and America's treatment. I mean, there's, uh, where's, where's the line? Is it just because it's happening now and there's a, there's a fear of uh, Russia expanding their aggressions? Or is it just the public opinion and sentiment seems to be, um, as it should be, supporting Ukraine? Well, we're two weeks, you know, almost, we're, we're less than two weeks, right, out from, from the marathon at this point. So I think, first of all, the practicality of doing other bans and sort of more of a larger blanket ban um, is simply, it, it's, it's an impractical step, one. Um, this, I think, is a discussion, quite frankly, that the international sports community has to have um, at another point in time. I can certainly see and think they should have this discussion. You know, how do we, as a sports community, as a global sports community across not just the running community, but all sports community, and include the International Olympic Committee in this, and FIFA, which, you know, again, with the World Cup, how do we figure out what our policy is. And quite frankly, it probably should be something along the line of a policy for when you have countries who are committing human rights violations, um, what, how does that impact athletes? And does it impact the average everyday athlete? That's who we're really talking about here, right? We're not talking about professional athletes. So in this case with the Boston Marathon. So I think there are some questions you need to answer. Does it impact the every, average everyday athlete? Do we start putting bans on professional athletes? I can see in the future the potential for bans on professional athletes, the bans on countries from competing. I mean, if you recall during apartheid South Africa, South Africa was not allowed to compete in the Olympic Games. So I think there is precedent there, and that may be in some instances where things may go. So, Dan, of course, the challenge here, obviously, the athletes both professional and, and the, the amateur, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking when they get caught up in this politics and, and can't compete. I think we've all expressed that. And at the same time, as someone who loves watching sports and loves uh, watching, you know, the Olympics when countries come together. I mean, you know, I, I vividly recall when the Koreas walked, North Korea and South Korea walked in together at the Olympic Games uh, years ago, and uh, and the and the ability that sports have to unify us, um, it 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 sometimes seems to me like this maybe doesn't help us to see each other as humans and and the joy of of competing against each other. Yeah, I, I think it's you know, that's an interesting point. Sports do unite, you know. I think there is some, uh, there are lines, you know, you, you listed five countries with highly questionable uh, human rights um, stances in the in the immediate term, uh, but there have been, you know, you could make that list very long uh, if, if we open the scope of what human rights abuses are, you know, and we shouldn't look beyond ourselves to start and, and things that we've been involved in. So I think it's something that um, in this scale, a line of, of this kind of direct aggression uh, and, and a, a, a war that's completely asymmetrical in terms of the, the two sides and their capacities uh, and it's completely out of, out of nowhere, you know, it's just uh, an act of aggression and, and atrocity that I think crosses a line. So yes, sports are unifying. Yes, we love all of seeing all of the nations compete in the Olympics and the marathon majors. And, and uh, again, like I said earlier, I, th I just think it's a privilege to be a part of that and there need to be lines and not to absolve everybody of all of the atrocities through history, but there also needs to be, I think, a willingness to forgive and move on as well uh, when when that happens, you know, sort of the same same thing with sanctions and removal of sanctions. You know, I think uh, as, as it applies to the economy, it can apply to sport. Um, so in the current moment, I, I, I absolutely think it's the right thing to do. Sure, you know, I'm struck by um, the, 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 the memories of the terrorist attack, the, the Boston Marathon bombing, and I just recall vividly uh, children from Syria sending messages to Boston uh, 
uh, over whatever the social media was at the time, uh, who, they themselves going through this terrible, you know, civil war in Syria, yet reaching out, and you know, the end of the world of the New York Yankees uh, fans singing "Sweet Caroline," uh, which you know really brought home the unity and um, putting things aside. It's certainly not as serious as other things, but it it, it always stayed with me. Um, it seems that that sensitivity um, also informed this decision to do that, to be un unified and show support for Ukrainians. Yeah, I mean, I think there is this desire to show up as one running community. I think Dan can speak to this as well, but I know as a runner, it is a very close-knit, very passionate community. And community is the operative word. It, it is, you know, if you're on social media, or if you're even running along the Boston Marathon course on any given weekend during the winter, there is a sense of community and unity. And I think it was all done in that spirit. And again, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, this is a more of a symbolic gesture at this point. It is to show support. And then, the, you know, the other five countries and the human rights violation, you know, there are political statements and sanctions, perhaps, in the international athletic among international athletic federations that can come down the line and maybe need to be reevaluated. But I think the context of this is more as symbolic gesture. Ukraine, we have your back, and I think it was also clear in the um, way in which they structured the policy as well, right? So Ukrainians who were entered and can't compete. They will either get a full refund or they will be able to defer to next year. I know it seems like a small thing, but that's important. You know, this is all designed to be supportive of Ukraine, Ukrainian runners, um, and to say, you know, listen, we oppose what Russia is doing, but unfortunately, it is the amateur runners who are going to pay the price. Dan, um, I've, I've I've seen Shira um, running. Um... <laughs> Like a maniac at a you know at a red light, staying warm before she crossed in front of my car, you know. Um, and I, I I know a lot of people who I don't necessarily like. Sure, I do like, and I do like you, Dan. But when they talk about running, they talk about how helpful they are to other people. And I always think, wow, you should really bring that into your personal life as a runner. But the community of of runners is a real thing, right? And 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 we shouldn't we shouldn't just kind of gloss over that. That this is this is is a is a gesture, but a, a meaningful one. It is absolutely. I mean, I've I've actually sat with as I'm just recalling as we're doing this interview, I sat with a running coach from Moscow for lunch at a at a international coach training session. And you know, I think when I just just think about being a person and and running around uh, on on the marathon course right now, when I see the Ukrainian flags, they give me hope. Uh, it, it's 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 an important symbol to see in the world right now, and I, I think it's one that the the running community or it's just a community of people <laughs> who enjoy the, these international races. Uh, who who feel the same things that a lot of things uh, a lot of people are feeling, and you know I do also feel a, a empathy for Russian my Russian friends who are here who are have nothing to do with anything who who feel the pain of what's going on also and also feel some blowback and um, maybe some uh, not responsibility isn't quite the right word but you know a, a, a conflict and a, yeah. and a and a unhappiness as well. There are definitely um, so it's, a humanity of of everyone who is united. Cheer Springer and Dan Fitzgerald, I thank you both for joining me, and I wish you well on your travels of running. And I won't run into you, Shira. Thanks so much for joining me. <laughs> thank you, Sue. That's it for tonight. But come back tomorrow for Talking Politics. Thanks for watching.